The final installment of our Welcome to Canada series on integrating Syrian refugees is a chance to learn from past mistakes and build on successes. We look back at a time when Canada accepted another large group of refugees. The boats are easy to spot, heavily overloaded, crowded decks. This one has close to 700 on board. They've been on the sea 10 days out of Haiphong in northern Vietnam. That's the voice of CBC's Peter Mansbridge in 1979. The plight of the Vietnamese boat people garnered international attention. Canada is one country that came to the aid of those that fled Southeast Asia. Between 1979 and 1981, Canada accepted 60,000 refugees. Like today's Syrian refugees, they were supported by a mix of private and public sponsorships. The successes and the challenges those refugees experienced in the years after their arrival is the subject of a decade-long study by a Toronto-based pr professor, Morton Beiser. Morton Beiser is a professor at Ryerson University and a scientist at St. Michael's Hospital. Thank you for joining us, and I want to ask you, first of all, with regards to the Southeast Asian boat people in the late 70s, what did Canada do well? Well, Canada, first of all, welcomed 60,000 refugees from Southeast Asia within two years. That's the biggest refugee influx we've ever had in this country and things went relatively well. In what way? What were we successful at? Finding them homes, finding them jobs? Yes, all of that. We, we did a study of the boat people. We followed more than a thousand over a 10-year period. And what we found that was that at the end of the 10 years, the refugees' unemployment rate was lower than the national average and actually lower than the local average. We were doing this study in, in Vancouver, so it was lower than the local average. And on average, the refugees were, were using fewer resources of the country than the average Canadian does. So from the point of view of what we usually think of as integration, the refugees mm. were doing very well. We're talking about this, of course, given that the Syrian refugees are, have already started to arrive. What are some of the weak spots, some things that your study illustrated that we didn't do so well that perhaps we can do better this time around? I think we didn't attend well enough to the mental health issues that uh, people brought with them. I mean, people who come from the, the kinds of war backgrounds that the Southeast Asians did and that the Syrians are coming from now, who have passed through uh, refugee camps and had to spend too long in these refugee camps, they come with a heritage of trauma which has created mental health problems. Not for everybody, I must say, because we shouldn't over, overdo it. However, 10 to 15 percent of refugees do suffer what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a terribly disabling disorder where people will periodically experience flashbacks and go back mm. to the uh, experiences they had before where they're more, it's difficult for them to trust other people because of awful mm -hmm. things that people did to them. Uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a difficulty with sleeping, with uh, being motivated mm -hmm. to, uh, to get on with life. So there is a, a, uh, a problem. And the, the issue is that before uh, what we did was we went along with the refugees in their silence. There is a way of, the, uh, refugees will often deal with uh, issues like post-traumatic stress disorder right. through silence. And we did a kind of collusion with mm. the refugees uh, rather than attending to it. We need to do better about that this time around. Then as now, there was a mixture of private and public sponsorships. What were some of the pros and cons of each of those, uh, of each of those approaches? Actually, our study showed that at the end of 10 years, the people who were privately sponsored were doing better than the ones who were government sponsored. Um, and so I think what we can say is that there's something good about private sponsorship and that maybe we need to think about that for the point of view of future policy with respect to refugees and refugee resettlement. Even if they were a little more intrusive, I saw that in your findings that the private sponsors kind of called them a lot. Well. Private sponsorship wasn't perfect. It had some hiccups, for sure. And one of the things was that sometimes private sponsors, in their zeal to be welcoming, 
were too intrusive. They didn't uh, recognize the balance between being welcoming mm -hmm. and being intrusive. So they, they bothered the refugee families too much sometimes. We had, a, we had a guest on earlier this week who said that in his sponsorship of families, he had hoped to see them on their feet economically within a year. What did you find with the Southeast Asian folks in terms of how long it took for them to be on their feet economically? Uh, by the two-year period after people had arrived, unemployment was very high and people were being were quite discouraged. It took much longer, it took eight to ten years before people were really on their feet doing well economically and going up the economic ladder. Do you think we re need, need to reset our expectations then in terms of how quickly that kind of uh, economic success will come to fruition? Yes, I think we have to learn to be more patient, and especially now because the economic situation is even more difficult now than it was in the uh, early 80s. How successful were they at learning English, a key component of so many parts of Canadian life? Or French if they happen to move to the province of Quebec? Right. Well, the study, we, we did the study in British Columbia, so I can only, only talk about English. Uh, most people did learn English, but there was a core of people the elderly, women, isolated people who did not uh, learn English and probably never did. Uh, I mean, they hadn't learned it by, by 10 years and probably never did. And I think that's, uh, that's very unfortunate. Professor Beiser, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. There's good karma and bad karma, and sometimes things come full circle in a wonderful way. Here's what we crowdsourced.